Okay, folks, so today we're going to move on to a, a new approach to thinking about why killing might be a bad thing to do. Uh, rather than a utilitarian approach, this is a rights-based approach. And if you saw the pre-lecture video for this week, I was trying to explain there the motivation for sort of why you might end up being dissatisfied with the utilitarian approach and in a way the sort of problem that the rights-based approach is trying to fix. So I recommend you check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, first, well done if you, for getting through the readings this week. Reading A is difficult, uh, but it's probably the most difficult all semester. And there's one more hard one also from Judith Thompson uh, next week, reading C uh, in the, the back of the, the study guide. Um, she's got this slightly odd manner of writing sometimes where she uses a very long sentence. And then there might be a noun phrase in that sentence. and she. Usually, when you have a long, complicated phrase in English and then you need to refer to the same idea again in the next sentence or a paragraph later, you shorten the phrase, right? You don't use the exact same cumbersome phrase. But she really wants you to know that's exactly what she's talking about, so she uses that phrase again. But like, kind of once you can see that's what she's doing, you can paraphrase it in your own mind rather than getting hung up on, crikey, why? I thought I had to deal with all those words last sentence. Why am I dealing with them again here? Is it? Okay, so... Uh, there is a kind of a payoff in, in precision that she's striving for. I'm not saying she always succeeds, but she is a, a very good philosopher, and that's, that's why, despite the difficulty, I, I like to set these readings. Okay, so, so do persevere. So first, though, what, what is a right? To think about rights, it's really important you think about these concepts of the ends of our, of our actions, the, the goals we're aiming for, versus the means that we choose. I take it you have many, many possible goals on any one day, right? One of your goals is not to feel hungry. Another goal is hopefully to uh, enjoy some conversation with your friends. Or another goal is to learn some philosophy or whatever else you're studying, right? All sorts of, you've got a goal just to get to university in the first place because in order to study, you have to have like the subsidiary goal of put some clothes on, get out the door, get to, get to university, find the lecture theatre, et cetera, et cetera. What are our particular means for doing those things, though, can vary, right? So for getting to university, you've got different means of transport you could choose. You could walk, you could ride, you could catch the bus, catch the train, et cetera, et cetera. In general, the way a consequentialist thinks is, really, all the action is here. It's about the outcomes you achieve. And we just pick between different means on the basis of how convenient, how likely are they to succeed, how costly might they be, right? So get the bus, take the car, look, just think about which will achieve the outcome better. Or if they're going to achieve slightly different outcomes, because I don't know, taking the car might lead to more net CO2 emissions, right? Well then you, it's not, so let's say this is getting to university via the bus, and emitting very little CO2, getting to university via the car and emitting a bit more CO2. Okay? Well, you don't really look at the means per se, car versus bus. It's not a car versus bus issue. It's a how is the world when I'm done issue, right? The world with more CO2 in it is a bit worse, let's say, so I should do this. That's the way a consequentialist thinks. And a rights-based theorist says, no, we, we can't, and this is a common mistake. Some people think, Okay, so we're not talking about outcomes anymore once we talk about rights. No, rights-based theorists care about outcomes as well, obviously. They want to achieve good things. But they say there is this other issue, which is some means they run into obstacles, people's rights. So you can sort of, this is my corny attempt to make this visual, right? Uh, rights are like these certain barriers saying some means are harder to justify using than others even if you really like the outcome it would lead to, if it infringes a right, that somehow casts into doubt the justifiability of going for that outcome. Okay? Sometimes that will mean it rules out an outcome altogether because there's no way to get there without infringing a right. Other times it might be you can do it by a rights infringing way or you can do it by a non-rights infringing way. Right? You, could, you could take a car to get to university using your own car, you could take a car to get to university, stealing your neighbor's car, right? Uh, 
this way looks less justifiable, right? Because it infringes your neighbour's rights. So, here are three key features that you tend to get with rights. First, usually, a right can be given up. Okay? So, I have a right that you not take my car to drive to university, but I can say, hey, if you want, you can borrow my car this week. And I've just given up the right I normally have. Or think about if some of you are renting property. The landlord is giving up rights they have over that land to you. You can now keep the landlord out and they would be infringing your rights if they walked in without permission. Right? Whereas before they signed a lease agreement with you, you would be the one infringing their rights if you walked in. So they kind of transferred the right of keeping people out of that property to you by virtue of you renting the property. Uh, some people think some rights can't be given up, and this is when you hear the phrase inalienable rights. So maybe you can't sell yourself into slavery, some people might think, because that's an inalienable right. You can't give up ownership of your body. Uh, rights focus on particular types of actions. So it's not consequentialist. Typically, we say... Uh, I don't know. Uh, certain actions like lying, stealing, punching, stabbing, these all sound like rights infringements. We don't talk about outcomes, how many people live, how many molecules of CO2 were there in the atmosphere. No one tends to have a right to a certain number of CO2 molecules in the atmosphere. That would be a very strange sounding right. Maybe it's logically possible, but no one is a big fan of such things. Okay. And rights will let us build in the distinction between killing versus letting die. Because when people talk about the right to life, usually what they almost always actually mean is not a right to the outcome where you live. They mean a right not to be killed, right? not to have your life ended in, by certain actions of other people. Right? So in fact, the right to life is an annoyingly misleading phrase because it tends to make you think, oh, well, dying infringes the right to life. But no, dying of natural causes, no one thinks that someone's infringed your rights. It's only when somebody, by their intentional actions, kills you that your right to life might be infringed. Right? So m most people who believe in rights would say there's no right to be spared death. Right? So there's a... Th yeah, question. Can society give up your rights for you? Like, um, say you live in a society where there are no property rights, but you have a lawnmower and your neighbour comes and takes it. Is that infringing your individual rights? person um, using their rights to take it from them. Good. So uh, it gets a bit complicated when we talk about property. I used property examples, so I invited this complication. But uh, it gets complicated because there's a question, do those rights exist only because there is law? Or are these somehow also rights that I just have morally, whether or not society respects them? And so some people, in, uh, some influential sort of uh, political philosophers like Thomas Hobbes basically thought until a lawmaker comes along you don't have any rights. Other philosophers like uh, then following on Hobbes, uh, uh, John Locke said no, 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 you still have some basic rights in, in nature before government comes along but then government can kind of complexify the story. But for our purposes, people like Thompson, she thinks certainly rights not to be physically harmed, you have whatever the government says. Right. The government can try and take away that right in law, but they would be violating your basic moral rights, rights, she thinks. So we should, for these purposes, since we're thinking about killing, focus on those nice clean cases where the, the, so the theorist of rights thinks that they're basic. Yeah. So it's inherent in individuals that they have the yeah. right to yeah. Yeah. So the, the sort of right that people think of as a moral right in this context is likely to be the sort of thing someone might call a human right in current day discourse. Right? something you just get because of who you are, not because the government is nice to you. Yeah. But maybe the right of a, a renter we only actually get because government set up complicated laws about what it is to be, to be in a lease agreement. Okay. Think back to transplant. Right. Why is it wrong to kill the one person, if this was your view? Why might you use, how could you use rights to explain the judgment that it's wrong to kill the one and save the five, even though, admittedly, it seemed to be a good outcome that would be achieved? Well, presumably, because it infringes the right to life 
of the one. So question, is it always wrong to infringe someone's rights? Can you just basically work out, okay, there's a right that's going to be infringed if you proceed with that course of action, therefore not, can't do it. End of story. Well, this is really the purpose of reading A. Thompson is using this example to make the claim not all rights are absolute. Or in other words, sometimes it's going to be justified to infringe a right. Not always. It's kind of as a special thing that happens when you justify infringing a right. Special circumstances apply, but at least it's sometimes it can happen. Okay. Here's the, the example she uses to illustrate this. So you've got a sick child in your house, and this sick child needs a particular medicine. You live in a remote place, you can't easily get to a store, maybe there's a blizzard, so you can't sort of travel to the, the shops to, to buy the right medicine. You need the medicine quickly. You know your neighbour is a pharmacist who keeps this nice supply of medicines in a big chest locked up on their back porch. Your neighbour's away, can't be contacted. Is it okay for you to break into the chest, take the medicine and give it to the child? She thinks, not only is it okay, you really ought to take the medicine. Right? It's the right thing to do in this case. But that would be infringing the rights of your neighbour because your neighbour, part of what it is to own that medicine is to have a right that you not take it without permission. So it looks like if Thompson's right about this case, this is a case where you ought to infringe your right. So you can put this, uh, what she's considering, into the form of an argument. First premise, by taking the medicine, you infringe your right. Second premise, you ought to take the medicine. Conclusion, sometimes you ought to infringe your right. Okay. At least on this occasion. Part of the point of putting it into standard form like this, even though it's a pretty simple argument, is Thompson is then going to systematically go through and consider ways to resist her own conclusion. Right? And this is a nice way of organising what those moves are to resist. Right? So let's go through those possible responses. So, by the way, what's the big picture here? Right? Why are we dwelling, at, and we are going to dwell for the next 10 or so minutes, on ways you could possibly say the right doesn't apply, speaking roughly, right? Why might we, we be interested in that? Well, many of us thought, in transplant, it's okay to kill a person. Why isn't that impermissible, impermissibly infringing their right to life? If that's going to be okay, and we're going to use a rights-based theory, we need some way to explain how do you overcome that typical constraint that says you can't kill people. Surely one of the most serious rights there is. Right? So that's why we want to exhaustively go through all the ways Thompson is contemplating in this more trivial case, where it's just a right to a bit of property. We're going to exhaustively consider all those ways you might get around that right. And then we're going to see, could any of them apply in the trolley case to explain why it would be okay to kill in trolley. Okay? So let's consider these ways of overcoming rights. So. Effectively, Thompson's saying, look, I admit this might sound a bit strange to your ears, that it's okay to infringe your right. Let's consider some alternative possibilities. One possibility is her first premise is false. Okay? So maybe it's not the case that by taking the medicine, you infringe your right. I've already commented on how sometimes the names we use for rights don't actually pick out precisely what they mean. So I said the right to life is not actually a right to guaranteed survival. It's a right not to be killed. And you might even think even that is still not precise enough because what if you believe capital punishment is justified? Then when you execute a criminal who's guilty of a capital crime, do you violate their right to life or their right not to be killed? Maybe not. Right? So maybe there's a special exception for unless you've been found guilty of a capital crime in a sort of just legal system or something like that. Who knows? Complicated case. And we will think a bit about such cases a bit later. So we shouldn't just trust from the phrasing of the way we offhandedly we speak about a right that we understand exactly what it involves. And maybe that's what's going on here in the case of the medicine owner. Normally, the medicine owner has a right that you not take the medicine without permission. But maybe it's something more complicated like they have a right your box not be broken into and your drug taken without your consent when there is no child who needs that drug for life. Right. It's got this big exception built in. 
And presumably that's not enough. There might be other emergencies that are warrant building in an exception. Right? But we just don't normally mention that because it's a rare, extreme exception, is the thought. So I like to call this, just to give this a more memorable name than saying the, the, the long sort of name for a right here, I call it the gappy rights explanation. Because the thought is, this right that you thought was a simple thing that just blocked taking the medicine, actually it has little exceptions in it. Gaps you can get through if the circumstances are extreme enough. Right? And this is a gap occasion when there's a child who needs that medicine to survive. D tip for the exam, don't say Judith Thompson calls this a gappy rights view. Okay? That's Toby calls it a gappy rights view. She isn't so flippant. Okay. Okay. Now, Thompson thinks when a right's infringed, when a right is in fact infringed, there'll be what she calls moral residue. These are like typical after effects in the moral world after you've messed with someone's rights. And what are the typical after effects? Well, you should try and pay for the damage done, right? If the right I infringed was by punching you, maybe I should pay for your medical bills. If the right I infringed was your property right, maybe I should pay to replace the property that I took or damaged. And also, maybe there's an obligation to apologise to the person whose right is infringed. Okay. That's kind of, the fact that these things occur is a sign that a right has been infringed. Okay. Well then, putting that thought together about what happens when a right gets infringed with the gappy rights idea, okay. suppose the gappy rights explanation applies to illness, which of the following would therefore be true, do you think? A, there should be no moral residue, B, the person who takes the medicine should replace it, or C, neither of the above. Have a think for a minute before you answer that, it's a bit tricky. Okay, hold up your cards. Okay, uh, slight majority Bs, but a bit of everything. Take a minute to talk to the person next to you and see if you can work that out. I'm just to, to help you, I'm going to go back a couple of slides to remind you what the Gappy Rights explanation is. Okay? Moral residue is the idea that after a right has been infringed, there are extra obligations. Obligations to pay compensation or repair damage and or to apologise. Okay, let me put, give you the question back. So, so the Gappy Rights idea is the idea that there's a gap in the right. When you go ahead and take the medicine, it's not true that you infringe your right. Okay? Then I gave you this little moral residue idea, which is an idea about what happens when you infringe rights. And now here's a question that puts the two together. Have a little chat amongst yourselves and I'll ask you one more time. I think. I think. Okay, let's try that. A show of cards. Cards up, everyone. Very good, we've all got it now. Indeed, right? So this, the tricky thing is here, right? First you were struggling to quickly put together gappy rights, moral residue, new concepts, yada, yada, yada. But also, many of you might think, yeah, the person who takes the medicine should replace it, right? But that's exactly Thompson's objection. She thinks, yes, you should replace it. And this proves the gappy rights view is wrong, okay? It must be that a right was in fact infringed here, okay? And not that there was some gap. Because otherwise, why would we think it's reasonable for the, the person who owned the medicine to insist, hey, you owe me compensation for damaging my chest and taking my medicine. Okay? Another reason, suppose that you could ask the consent of the owner without too much difficulty. If really this were a gappy case, then probably you could go, oh, I don't need their permission. There's no right here, just take it. Okay? But most of us think, no, you should go and ask, if you can. Right? And so it also suggests we're aware that there is in fact a right, some sort of constraint we're under. So Thompson says, that is, that's one way in general, maybe this is possible, that there are exceptions like this, okay, but not in illness. It doesn't explain what's going on in illness. Second possibility. She says, maybe, although we act wrongly if we go ahead, we are not to be blamed for doing so. What you did was excusable. This is a bit tricky getting a handle of exactly what Thompson means by excusable. 
but I'm going to call this the excusable violation account. I'll spend a minute or two explaining some of these concepts. First, there's this distinction she's making between infringing a right versus violating a right. And it's just important we master this terminology. It's a very basic point, but often trips people up. By infringing, and she's not saying this is how normal English works, she's just saying this is how I'm going to use the words because I want to make this fussy point. Right? By infringing, I just mean doing something which a person has a right that you not do. Right? It's, it's just a word for going against a right. By violating, she means not only do you go against a right, so it's, it is an infringement, but it's an infringement which we are confident is morally wrong, all things considered. It's unjustified. Right? So we're, you can use the word unjustified, wrong, impermissible. They all mean the same thing here. Okay? So commonly, people walk away from reading Thompson too quickly and think, oh, right, so there's infringing rights and there's violating rights. And that's not the distinction she means at all. Right? She means there's infringements, which is any time you violate, you go against someone's rights. Many of the times when we infringe, we probably also do the wrong thing. That's violating. But it might be possible that there are cases, in fact, this is what Thompson thinks happens in the illness case, where you infringe the right, but you do the right thing by infringing the right. right? That's her whole argument. She's saying you should take the medicine even though it infringes the right. So you might want to use the word mere infringements if you're trying to ding indicate this category, infringements that are not violations. Okay? But that the whole reason you use mere is you mean it's an infringement that's not also a violation. Okay. Quick question on this incredibly elementary point. What's the best way to describe the relationship between infringing and violating? Is it A, violation and infringements are two completely different ways to break a right? B, infringements are a special type of rights violation. Or C, violations are a special type of rights infringement. Hold up your cards. Excellent, we're all getting this. Indeed, it's C. Very good. Okay. So, let's come back to this concept then of an excusable violation of the right. It's a violation, and we know what that means by definition now is, that means it's wrong, unjustified. So remember the argument we had before, where I had first premise, by taking the medicine you infringe a right, this is now a way of denying the second premise, the one that says actually you ought to take the medicine. This, the idea here would be you really, really do the wrong thing by taking the medicine. Okay. Why does it seem like you do an okay thing? Well, because it is excusable. I haven't said much about excusability yet. What does excusable just mean? It's not to do with what is the right and wrong thing to do. It's to do with how I respond to your behaviour after you've done the wrong thing. So I might recognise you are under pretty difficult circumstances. And I might say, normally I punish people who take medicine really strictly. But you did it under pretty dire circumstances, so I won't punish you as much. Maybe not at all, but I'll still sort of frown at you a bit because you did the wrong thing, right? It's a violation. Another way you might be familiar with this distinction is think about the way at law we distinguish between murder and manslaughter. In some sense, they're both ways of violating people's right to life. You're killing people in an unjust way. You still get punished, but you get punished a lot less for manslaughter than you do for murder. Right? We're recognising that, OK, it's, it's pretty bad, but it's somewhat excusable compared to outright murder. Okay. So the, it's really very much about our response after the fact. It's not about the rightness of what you did. Yeah. But another thing you can try and do to get kind of clear on, well, what, what's going on here? If, it, if it's excusable, doesn't that kind of mean it's OK? That, that's the, the, the funny feeling you get, right? If it's excusable, isn't it justified? But Thompson is saying, no, there's a difference. One way to think about it is, should you intend to repeat the behaviour afterwards? Okay? If it was actually wrong, even though we may not have punished you much the first time, Right, because we thought it was somewhat excusable, okay, it was still the wrong thing to do, so you shouldn't intend to do it again. Imagine you run late for school, right, and the teacher tells you off. And you say, I'm really sorry, I slept in, it won't happen again. Right? The teacher says, OK, I'll let you off the hook this time. Right? They've just excused your violation of the rule. Right? They're not saying it's OK, do it again next time. They're saying, this time I'm not going to come down on you too harshly. 
right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, possibly. Yeah. In fact, probably. Yeah. It, hmm. So it, it will get tricky. Uh, I think that. So the, the, the sorts of clear cases people tend to think of excuses, what if you were operating under mistaken beliefs when you did this wrong thing? So it's a bit tough expecting you to do exactly the right thing when you had all these mistakes in your belief, right? So that might be a version of this where you didn't realise the medicine wasn't free for anyone to take or something like that. We might say that's an excusable violation. Um, but other times are when people are under huge personal burden and duress, right? And so Thompson says, she ends up ditching this account, right? She says, this doesn't seem right because you really ought to take the medicine, right? Um, but maybe the notion of excusability would be more relevant if it were a case of huge personal burden, like it's your child that's going to die. Then excusability might be the relevant sort of concept. But though again, I think she'd say, still, you ought to take the medicine because the right's just not that important. But excusability should be to do with personal burden, if it's so very hard for you to do the right thing, or uh, personal bad circumstances of, I don't know what the right thing is to do. Is it to do with the outcome? Well, you might say the burden thing is a type of outcome, but it's about how the outcome impinges on you. Yeah. Good. So basically she just says, no, this is not plausible. If, let's say you save the child's life and the medicine owner comes back and says, hey, you broke my chest. Okay. Would, you, would it be right for you to say, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again? Right? No, if there's another sick child next week, you're going to break into that chest again. You intend to repeat it fully. Right? Well, she, she thinks you'd be pretty sick if you didn't intend to, repeat, to repeat the action, right? So, uh, so she thinks you, in fact, ought to take the medicine. So she thinks the excusable violation account does not explain what's happening in illness, and the gappy rights account does not explain what's happening in illness. So she thinks her original argument stands. It is justified to infringe a right, right? The right really is there. How do we know that? Because there's moral residue. You really ought to take a right. How do we know, know that? Well, she just says so. So, if it's possible to be justified to be doing the right thing when you infringe a right, there's one more concept she wants to introduce. This is stringency. And this is some way of kind of measuring how easy is it to justify infringing a right. The idea is the more stringent the right is, the harder it is to justify infringing it. Proper, the personal property owned by this medicine owner next door to you is surely not very stringent. It's not a very important right. Okay. Maybe you could break into it just to stop the child vomiting violently rather than to save the child's life. Because right? it's not very nice vomiting and hey, it's just a little bit of property damage. Okay. You don't need the circumstances to be so extreme to justify infringing it. But what if I had to, I don't know, break my neighbour's leg in order to save the child from the illness? Okay. Not having your legs broken surely is a pretty stringent right. right? And maybe it's not possible to justify that. What if it requires killing my neighbour? Well, surely that's one, a very, very stringent right indeed. One, and at the limit, an absolute right is one which you think can never be justifiably infringed. So it's effectively saying it's infinitely stringent. Okay. Think back to the sanctity of life view, the view that said it's never okay to kill an innocent human being. That's basically the view that there's a right not to be killed and it is infinitely stringent. Right, so it's a nice way you can fit sanctity of life now into the rights-based framework. But you don't have to have such an extreme version. Okay. So Thompson has illustrated with his, his example the way rights don't have to be absolute constraints. But she's leaving it open. Maybe the right to life is an absolute constraint. Uh, we, we don't know. We need to sort of go through and develop a theory of how stringent are all the different rights that are in play. Okay? But the idea is it can be justified to infringe a right if it's necessary to avoid a very bad outcome. This is why I was a bit hesitant about your question about is it about outcomes because justification primarily, the, the key example is all to do with to avoid a very bad outcome or to achieve a very good outcome. Okay. I'm going to review question. Which of the following facts better explains why it is permissible to take the medicine in the case that Thompson, we'll, we'll call illness from Thompson? 
A. The child's right to life is more stringent than the neighbour's property right. B. The good outcome to be achieved, saving a life, outweighs the stringency of the neighbour's property right. Or C. Neither is better, these are equally good or bad explanations. Okay, a little bit of a rainbow effect again. Have a chat to the person next to you. This is quite a tricky one. Okay, let me have a show of cards again. Okay, uh, still a bit of a rainbow. Any suggestions? Anyone want to explain why they voted the way they did? Excellent. So it's just really about the outcome would be better if the child was fine, Good. Right. That's, that's exactly the right answer, right? That it's tempting. We, it's, it feels good to sort of mention the child's right to life. But if we're going to be serious and organized about a rights-based theory, a right to life is just a right not to be killed. And so if we let the child die, its right to life is not infringed. Okay? It's a bad outcome. And maybe you can justify infringing the property owner's right by appeal of it's necessary to avoid this really bad outcome, but it's not a bad outcome that involves a rights infringement. Okay? So imagine, here's where the child dies, here's where the medicine's used and the child lives. And suppose this is the, the nice case where the medicine owner's around and gives me permission, but I don't have that option. All I've got is to take the medicine without permission, and that's going to infringe your right. And what justifies that infringement is this outcome is so much better than that outcome. It's not that if I did this, I'd be infringing an even worse right. Okay? I can imagine variants like that, right? but here's what you'd have to do to imagine it. Suppose the child is not sick through bad luck, but because I poisoned it. Right? Then it would be like, oh, gee, if I do nothing, I will infringe the child's right to life. But if I take the medicine instead, I will infringe the right of the medicine owner that's a less stringent right, that's the thing I should do, right? But that's, see how that's a trade-off between killing versus stealing rather than letting die versus stealing. Good. Okay. So, um, yep. would a utilitarian argue that letting die could be considered killing? A utilitarian would say letting die is not intrinsically different from killing. Show me the consequences. Are the consequences of this letting die really bad? And are the consequences of this killing surprisingly good? Then kill. Whereas a rights-based theorist never says that. They always go, oh my goodness, there's killing involved. That's extra, extra hard to justify. Maybe it's justifiable, but it has to be like spectacularly bad consequences to avoid. Yeah. Okay, so just to summarize where we've got to, right? That little example that Thompson uses has given us this whole menu of ways of thinking that it might be kind of possible to get around a right. She's got one way that she thinks is the correct way to explain what's happened in illness. That's the justified infringement story. But th we're not going to ignore those other two ways because they could be relevant for other cases we want to discuss. So remember, the gappy rights view is the idea that, oh, there's some exception. We just didn't notice it when we were speaking quickly about what the right is. So no right gets infringed at all. And the other possibility is the excusable violation, which says, look, actually you're doing the wrong thing. It's just that you got confused. If you thought it was the right thing, what you instead were mixing it up with was the fact that you don't want to punish this person as much as usual because we recognize it was a very difficult circumstance or they were confused or mistaken or something like that. Okay? So with those three options, gappy rights, justified infringement, excusable violation, can we explain what's happening in trolley? Because it seems now really easy to explain why you should not go ahead and transplant. Because it would be infringing the right to life. That's a very stringent right. So surely it's not justified to infringe it, even if it can achieve a very good outcome of saving five. But in that case, how can we explain the permissibility of killing in trolley? Is it a case of, well, the right to life of the one is gappy. There's an exception on trolley tracks. Or is it a case 
that it actually is the wrong thing to do but we'll excuse you? Or is it the case that no, it really is justified to go ahead and infringe that right? So let's, let's go through and see if we can apply those explanations to this case. So, suppose you thought, we're just, so what we're doing now is hypothetically trying on those explanations, checking the implications through, through one of these questions, and then we can assess whether it's plausible or not. Suppose you thought diverting the trolley, killing one, saving five, is an excusable violation of the right to life. Which of the following statements are compatible with this view? By compatible, I just mean they could be true together, right? They don't contradict each other. One, it is morally justified to turn the trolley. Two, we ought not to criticise those who turn trolleys as harshly as most murderers. Hold up your cards. Okay, split between B's and C's. One of those is the correct answer. Uh, I think I might give you, uh, can I just hear from any, well, no, it's not that. Take, take a minute to, to discuss amongst yourselves. See if you can come to the, the right one. It's definitely B or C. So the question is, is this compatible with the idea of it being an excusable violation? That's really what we're all talking about. And just as a hint, I'm going to remind you of the definition of violation. Okay, no, another show of cards. What are we thinking? Good, I think B is spreading, which is correct. Okay, so definitely Proposition 2 is compatible with excusable violation because excusability is all about not criticising people as harshly. That's basically what it means, right? But you cannot say it's morally justified to turn the trolley because being a violation means being unjustified. In other words, you can use to get the same concept as be, means being wrong or impermissible. Okay? I'm just going to use those interchangeably. Right? So if you thought that this was the right way to explain what's happening in trolley, that it's an excusable violation, then you would have to say, you know what, it's actually not justified to pull the lever. It's just that we won't treat you as badly as most murderers. We won't treat you like the surgeon maybe in the transplant or something like that. Um, but then you've got to ask why, right? Just because it's really unpleasant watching five people squashed by a trolley and slightly more pleasant for you to watch one or because you had some mistaken beliefs about what's going on? Th that doesn't seem entirely plausible. Also, this just doesn't seem to explain what most of you thought when I asked you in week one. You said, no, it really is justified to pull the lever. You didn't say it's really wrong. You know, th not think about it another way. You've done it once, you've been very unlucky, you're on a trolley track, you pulled the lever, and we say, wow, well, thank goodness the five were saved. But now, if that were to happen again, what would you do next time, right? Are you like, remember the story I told about you're late for school and the teacher excuses you, right? Where you say, I promise I'll never do it again, okay? Those of you who thought it was okay to pull the lever, surely you're not going to say, oh, well, I did it that once, but I promise I'll never do it again. Rather, you're saying, no, I did the right thing, and if I was in that situation again, Unlucky though that would be, I would do it again. So this doesn't seem very plausible. Next possibility, could, could it be a justified infringement? So remember, that's the theory that she thinks applies to the illness case. In illness, it's justified to infringe the property right because it avoids a very bad outcome. Here's a hypothesis. Maybe in trolley, it's justified to infringe the right to life of the one because it avoids a very bad outcome. Well, there's a pretty obvious worry about that. Why isn't the transplant case just the same? If it's justified to infringe one person's right to life in order to save five lives, 
then doesn't that just apply any time I come up with a kill one to save five scenario? Why wouldn't it work just as well in, trans in transplant? Right. So this, this seems prima facie pretty unpromising to me. Uh, it, it doesn't look like there's some special badness of the trolley deaths that's so much worse than the deaths by organ failure that makes it justified in the one but not the other. Maybe you could come up with some distinction that's going to be hard work, I'd suggest. Okay. Is there a question there? Yeah, good. So that is a distinction she thinks she tries out to explain the difference. But I'd say that's, and I think she'd agree with me, that's not so much a just difference in the outcome, it's a difference in the means, right? And so since justification in the form of justified infringement works by pointing at just how good is the outcome, it wouldn't fit. That would might, I think if that worked, that would give you a gappy rights explanation. To say that's the reason why this way of going here doesn't actually, actually infringe your right. But yeah, good. Okay. Any questions at this point? Any other questions? Okay, so let's try the third one. Oh, sorry. So I, I've basically given away the answer here, right? I'm saying if killing in trolley is a justified infringement, so too is killing in transplant. Well, I at least think this is highly arguable, right? That they should generalize. Okay. Final hypothesis, though, that there is a gap in the right to life. So instead of just having a right not to be killed, we have a right not to be killed by trolleys provided there are not five people needing saving by diverting the trolley, or something like that. Okay. How plausible is that? Well, I think that at least fits the feeling many of us have. When many of us feel, yeah, it's okay. It doesn't, doesn't infringe anyone's rights. I don't know why, but it just <laughs> feels that way, is the thought. Okay. But this really needs to be better explained then. Okay. Normally, if there weren't five other people on the track, Say so that the trolley is sailing down the left-hand track, completely empty. You see a person on the right-hand track, you think, what fun. Oh, I'll divert the trolley onto a person on the right-hand track. You'd be a murderer, right? You'd be not just infringing, but violating one of the most important rights there is. Somehow, the presence of five needing saving is going to trigger an exception, but it's not going to trigger an exception in a transplant case. Without some sort of further explanation, this looks ad hoc, right? By which I mean, it's not a principled explanation, it's just sort of making a convenient exception. So I've forgotten your name. The Elizabeth. Elizabeth. So Elizabeth's pointed at something that might be able to help us here, right? But, and Thompson tries this out in reading B. I'm not going to have time to talk about it today, but I'll try and fit it in at the beginning of the next week. She says, well, there seems to be this difference that in transplant, you use the body of a person, you kill them and you use their body parts to save five. Whereas in trolley, it's just this unhappy accident that there's somebody in the way of my rescue method. My rescue method is the right-hand track and someone happens to be on it. If, just before I pulled the lever, the person on the right-hand track disappeared in a puff of smoke, my plan of pulling the lever would still be a damn good plan of pulling the lever, right? Whereas if the surgeon was thinking, aha, I'll save the five, and the one healthy patient disappears in a puff of smoke, they've got no plan left. So maybe that's the difference. Turns out that's going to be a difficult explanation to maintain as well, but let's try that next week, okay? So here's the thought. We're going to th next week, I'm going to present you sort of Thompson's sophisticated, compromised, state-of-the-art theory as to why it's okay to go ahead and trolley. But in between, we're going to try to think a bit about what rights are for, and that might help to guide us as to why there might be exceptions in some cases, but not others, okay? So but do try to take home from today these three ways to get around a right. You need to kind of load them up in your mental vocabulary so that you can wheel them out later when we're thinking about cases in self-defense, for instance. Okay? See you next week. <laughs>